I'd like for you to open up your Bibles to Joshua chapter 9. It's in, on page 337 of your pew Bible. Today, I'd like to talk about let's make a deal. How many of you guys have made deals in the past? How many of you guys have made bad deals in the past? You know, especially buying cars. Sometimes you just get a good deal. Sometimes you get a bad deal. Sometimes you don't know what you're getting. And sometimes it's a blessing and you don't even realize it's a blessing. So, sometimes the news that you get happens to be fake news or maybe not full truths in what you're going to tell you. In 1976, when I got out of high school, I joined the Army. And the recruiter asked me, he says, what do you want to do? I says, I want to go four years, I want college money, and I want to do something easy. He goes, you want infantry? I said, no. Combat arms? I said, no. I want to do four years, get my college money, and go. He says, okay, I tell you what, how about computers? That sounds good. It's new. I'd be cutting edge. I said, that'd be great. Signed my name, showed up at basic training, which everybody goes through, didn't think much of it. And then we landed at Fort Benning, Georgia, and we're driving in, and I'm looking around. I'm going, okay, I've got artillery. I've got the infantry. I've got ranger school. I've got, I'm going, what is going on? And the drill sergeants talked to us, and I found out that I was an 11 Charlie, which Savannah didn't mean nothing. 11 Charlie is an indirect fireman crewman. And I sat there, and I looked at the drill sergeant, I said, well, they told me computers. He, says, he laughed. He says, well, you will compute rounds. It was fake news. He lied. And... I went ahead and went through it because, one, I could not prove that he lied, but yet it was fake news. I read a thing on Facebook the other day that was talking about countries that have taken weapons away, and, of course, after they've taken the weapons away, massive killings occurred. Well, Facebook came back and says that's fake news because they could not prove that the killings only occurred because they took the guns away. It is true they took the guns away. It is true they killed millions of people, but you have not proven the connection between the two. So therefore, it's fake news. Sometimes fake news is fake news in itself. Sometimes, I love the comments I heard on television the other day. We never had fact checkers until the truth started coming out. Then we started seeing what was happening. Well, this is what's happening here in Israel. The fake news was out. There's nothing new that happened way back in the day. It is, you know, we're not the first generation to hear the truth versus lies. How many of you ever, how many of you ever lied? Okay. And the old saying is, how many of you guys have lied? Be honest, you're in church. How many of you have stolen anything? So I'm standing here preaching to liars and thieves. <laughs> but in the truth, that's exactly what's happened. But what does the devil try to tell you? Well, that's a little white lie. That pen didn't hurt nobody. You know, that's, that, you know, you just took a few toilet papers. In the Army, that's what the biggest thing there was because I was stationed in Germany and toilet paper on the economy was very expensive. So what a lot of the young GIs were doing, they were stealing toilet paper and selling them on the economy and making money. And people said, well, it's not hurting nobody. So I remember their supply sergeant then, he solved the problem. Once a month, we had to go down to the supply room 
and signed for toilet, a roll of toilet paper. And you couldn't get no more toilet paper until the end of the month. And so you had to carry your toilet paper around everywhere you went because they would not put them in there. But what happened? Well, the lie was, you know what? It's just toilet paper. You're not hurting nobody. Except, how many of you ever had to go to the restroom and there is no paper? You know, it happened to me in Africa. I'm sitting there, I'm going, okay, what do I do? Well, for the good of the cause, a T-shirt was sacrificed. <laughs> but it don't hurt nobody. See, sometimes we think that because it doesn't hurt nobody, it's okay. The devil tries to justify our actions. And the enemy tries to turn things around. Uh, you know, I love, and I didn't quote this. This came from somebody. I don't know who it was, but it's not mine. It is said, if lying was a sport, it'd be the most popular sport event today. Can you imagine if you had the liars at, at the Olympics? Who could come up with the biggest lie? You know? Children, and I know, contrary to your proper belief, children lie to you. Okay, I had parents saying, well, my child would never lie to me. You're living in a deceptive, in a cloud. There's something wrong, because they do. You know, politicians, do they lie? Of course, they got the reputations of being lying, you know? How do you, the old saying is, how can you tell if a politician is lying? When their lips are moving, when they're talking. And they could tell some whoppers of a lie straight-faced. I mean, without even scringing. I think sometimes politicians are better actors than any Hollywood actor could ever be. They could stand there in your face and lie blatantly, and, I, and sometimes I hear it on television, I'm looking at it, I said, you know, we have videos of you saying something different. They don't care, because the devil doesn't care. The devil will lie to your face. He doesn't care if you can prove him wrong. But he'll try to convince you of a lie, because that's what he's trying to entrap you. Every day we hear people telling lies. But problem is, we're always usually telling a lie for something that the person wants to hear. You know the old saying, I, I saw this many times, and you probably have read this, when your wife comes up and puts on a dress and says, does this make me look fat? Men, that's a trap. Keep your mouth shut and move on. You can't win that one. But the devil will try to do things to entrap you, to get you into a place that you can't back out. Now, let's go back to Israel. They had just came across, last week we talked about, they had come across the Jordan River, they had taken down Jericho, they were defeated by Ai. Achan was punished. They went back and they conquered Ai. They were on a roll now. They were moving along. And they were going to take on these nations. And they were ready to take that promised land, to take that promise that God had given them. They had victories under their belts. They are proud of what they were doing. They were ready to go forward. They were ready to take that promise that God had given you. But what happened? Well, there was a deception that came. An enemy came and deceived Israel. And it seemed innocent. And this is what I'm telling you today. When the devil comes and when he starts to talk to you, it's going to make sense. It's going to be logical. It's going to be okay. Only way you can find 
that you're doing something wrong is if you get into the Word of God and read the Word of God. I don't care how much sense it makes if it goes against the Word of God. I'm not hearing it. And I'm not going to listen to it. So this is a lesson for the church today. You see, a lot of folks do not seem to know that they're playing with the devil. Many Christians don't understand that, you know what, I'm just dabbling here and I'm just dabbling there. He doesn't understand it. You may think you're playing, but the devil is not playing with you. The devil is trying to seriously take you down. But what do we do? We keep playing. It's okay. Well, we look at this picture. It's okay. Or we do this. It's okay. Or we take a little lie. It's okay. But these lies come back. And they mount up. And the devil twists the truth. He's not playing. What happened to Samson? He had to learn the hard way that playing with Delilah was deadly. See, Samson thought he was smarter than the devil because he kept going back to Delilah. And Delilah, was Delilah playing with him? No, Delilah was trying to kill him. But yet Samson went. What about all the other people around the Bible that we read? The enemy is not playing with us. We must realize the danger of becoming too friendly with the enemy. As we study this passage today, let's learn a lesson that Israel had to learn the hard way. Let us learn to understand what's happening. Now, there's two things I need to talk about today. One, the chairman of the executive committee, an elder of this church, told me last week, you need to have a sermon that's about an hour to an hour and a half long. Now, I ain't going to tell you who he is. He's not here today. His name is Carl. So if it's long, you can call Carl up. And then coming in this morning, I was told, I can't hear you. So if I'm loud, that's because I'm accommodating someone in the congregation that says he don't have his hearing aids. So those are truths. Those are actually said. But could I twist that? Could I make that into a lie? Absolutely. And the devil will use a truth statement, even in joking, and twist it and make it sound like, you know what? Jim, you are authorized because the guy, the guy that told you this, he is the chairman of the executive committee. He's an elder of the church, even though I know that he was what? Being serious, no, he was joking. But that's why he said it. <laughs> Makes sense to me. But let's look at this passage. Israel was on their way to conquer the promised land. The Gibeonites, their enemies, had deceived Israel into making a covenant with them that God told them not to do. God had forbid them to make a covenant with the people of Israel, with the people of the land. He said, do not make a treaty with the Gibeonites. Do not make a treaty with the enemy. Do not do this. And what did Israel do? Because it made sense. Because it looked right. Because it made compassion. It looked like it was proper. What they didn't understand is they were being deceived. Same thing as closing churches across the world. There's a study out right now that 40% of churchgoers in America have not returned to the church. They've gotten comfortable. The devil deceived the church. Says, you don't have to go to church. You can watch it on television. You don't have to do... I'm going to tell you something. You bite off on that fruit, you will eventually quit watching it on television. 
You will eventually quit hearing it on the radio. You will eventually find other things to make up your time. And the devil had put that apple in your mouth and you've done chomp down on it. Same as Eve and same as Adam did in the Garden of Eden. The enemy can be deceptive. You need to understand that. This is why it's so important that you read the word of God. Israel had a reputation of having victory after victory after victory. And they were conquering these nations. They were destroying these nations. No single nation could form, could defeat Israel. But look at Joshua 9, 1 and 2, if you, don't have, if you have your Bibles open. And it came to pass when all the kings who were on the side of the Jordan and the hills and the lowlands and in the coast of the great sea towards Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Pretzites, the Hiphites, and the Jebusites heard about it, and they gathered together to fight with Joshua and Israel with one accord. I'm going to tell you something. The enemy is not your friend. That guy that's doing drugs is not your friend. That guy that's selling the prostitution is not your friend. That guy that invites you to the bar is not your friend. He is trying to deceive you. He's trying to destroy you. Look what happens. The enemy, they can't stand each other. But yet when it comes to the church, they will gather and they will make alliances as long as they can defeat the church of Jesus Christ. And in Israel here, all of them got together. They figured, well, we can't defeat them. And the Bible tells us later that Israel could not have defeated one of those nations. They were more powerful than they were. So they had all of these nations coming together against Israel. And why? Why did the Gibeonites then decide to go the other way? Look at Joshua 3, 5. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard that Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they worked a crafty and went and pretended to be ambassadors. Stop right there. We are ambassadors of Christ. Too many false prophets and false teachers are coming in with the right words, with the right things, and being pretending to be something that they are not. We had it here at one time. I believe in all my heart that the apostles were called by Jesus Christ. And I believe when I read the Bible that the apostles saw Jesus before the cross, saw Jesus after the cross. It means they saw him alive as human, they saw him raised from the dead. And every one of those apostles that we call apostles were called by Jesus himself, even Paul. When did Paul get called to the ministry? When Jesus showed up on the road to Damascus. So when I hear modern day apostles, are they twisting words? Are they twisting the truth? They pretended to be ambassadors and they took old sacks on their, on their donkeys, old wineskins, torn and mended, old and patched sandals on their feet and old garments on themselves and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. They put on a show. And I've seen this many times. I saw the thing on television the other day. There was a woman begging. She had raggedy clothes on, and she was pretending to be pregnant. A lady gave her some money for food and decided to follow her. And when she left the place and no one was around, she took the bags out from under her, her skirt and got into a brand new car. She had everything to deceive people. That's what the Gibeonites did. They went, they put on a good show. They came to Joshua with a story. The only problem, it was fake news. They knew that Israel was on a roll. They knew that Israel was defeating nations after nations after nations. And the Gibeonites knew that they were in the crosshairs, even though they had five other kings ready to fight with them. They were afraid of the people of God. They were afraid of Israel coming in. And they wanted to make a deal. They had more people 
They were stronger. They had more kingdoms. They had more influence. But yet the Gibeonites said, that's God's people. Today, churches, you got the world fighting against us. But we're, more, we're, we're so busy trying to, bring, trying to make our church look like the world instead of making the world look like the church that Jesus died for. Everything that we do, we're trying to accommodate the enemy. They're not your friends. Israel had to learn the hard way. The Gibeonites apparently had concluded that if we don't make this deal, you know what? We're going to lose this battle. So they went and put on a good show. I've seen many people come to us. I had a young man come to me years ago when I was in Favel at the church. We we're cleaning out the area. We we're rebuilding the sanctuary for the English ministry. And a guy came by, and he pulls in, he stops, and he comes to me. He says, you know, I was driving up and down uh, this road, and the Holy Spirit talked to me and says, these men out there working, these are men of God, and that I need to go in there and talk to them. And he came, and he started, he says, I came in here, man, I tell you, I didn't want to come, but the Holy Spirit insisted that I come. So I'm coming here to tell you that God has sent me here. And I says, really, what you need? Well, I need to pay my rent. And I looked at him and says, you know, God sent you here? And he goes, yeah. And I says, and we're working? He says, well, yeah. Then God sent you here to work. Here's a hammer. And he looked at me. He goes, what do you mean? I says, God sent you here, and we're working, and we're doing God's work. We're building a sanctuary so that the worship of the word of God could be preached from. And he called you, and he talked to you. So that means he wants you here. Here's a hammer. And he turned around and he cussed me out and says, you're just so cheap you don't want to give anybody any money. I said, no, I'm just not a fool. See, he thought he could say the right words. You got to be smarter than that. So, how did the Gibeonites, how, what did they do? How did they deceive the people of God? Well, first of all, they used deceptive tricks. When the Israelites heard the Israelites were headed in their direction, they devised a scheme to get Israel to make peace with them. The first words used, look at Joshua 9, 11 and 13. What did they say? This is what they said. Therefore, our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions, you, for the journey, and go meet them, and say to them, we are your servants, and now, therefore, make a covenant with us. This bread of ours we took hot from our provisions, from our house on the day we departed to come to you. But now, look, it is dry and moldy. And these wineskins, which were filled, were new when we left. Now see that they're torn. And these garments and our sandals have become old because they were very long journey. And then the men of Israel looked, took some of their provisions, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. What did they say? They, they planned this. They took old bread. They took old clothes. They took old stuff. And they said, we're from a far country. And they set up to deceive Israel. The devil does that to us. They deceive, they come, they know what you're thinking, they know what's in your heart, and the devil comes to destroy. The Bible tells in Ephesians 6, 1, it says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand up against the willies, the tricks of the devil. And the Bible says, they did not seek God first. When the devil comes, seek God first. Find what there is. We help people in this city. We give out benevolence. But since we started this policy, 
And our policy is very simple. Do you need help? Yes, we're desperate. Then you come to church on Sunday morning, you fill out this form, and you have the pastor sign it, that you attended service, you come back on Monday morning, and we'll give you $30. And I think this year we've given out a total of $70. Because what I'm doing is I'm not going to fall for their trickery. Because even if they come for an hour, or an hour and 15 minutes, 30 bucks is pretty good money. And what do they have to do? They have to hear the word of God. And they don't want to hear the word of God. They just want to use God's money to go do what they want to, but they don't want to be transformed by hearing of his word. And therefore, it's the devil coming into my office trying to trick me to take money that this church has given in tithes and offering and give it to the devil. You need to find where the devil is trying to trick you and not be like Israel. Seek out God. Listen, as a Christian, if you think the devil is not trying to trick you, to deceive you every day, you need to wake up. Satan would like nothing better than to trip us up, to cause us to fall into one of his traps. Just before Jesus died, he told Peter in Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has asked for you that he might shift you as wheat. Satan wants us to fall. Satan wants to attack us no matter who we are. My family is under attack. This church is under attack. We got to be smarter than the devil. The devil will come. He will try to trick us. He wants us to fail. He wants us to do things. And he does not want us to seek the counsel of God. Satan uses deceptive tricks just like the people of the Gibeonites did. In Joshua 9, 4, and 5, we just discussed it. What do they come with? The old sacks, the old stuff. The Gibeonites had taken every step possible to deceive Israel into believing that they were from a far country. Why? Why were they so concerned that they're going to try to convince Israel that they were from a far country? Because the devil knew that Israel was ordered not to make a covenant with them. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is telling you today, Do not make a covenant with the devil in the cities of that you walk. Do not make your deals with the devil. It will come and haunt you later on. Did you notice what they carried? What did they say? They carried old sacks on their donkeys, broken and bound up wineskins, patched shoes, shabby clothing. What did they say, though? The only reason it's all worth is because we walk so hard. We went so far for you to meet with you. Look at our stuff. People come in our doors every week asking for money. I used to have them come in and sit in the office for a Bible study. And my first question to them is, why should I steal from the congregation and give you money? And they look at me and go, what do you mean? It's not my money. It's anything I give you is because someone in this congregation put that money in an offering plate and and gave it to God. Now, why should I take it from God and give it to you? Well, because you're supposed to take care of the poor. Fine. Come to church on Sunday morning. I don't like church. I've learned, and I've been tricked. I've given money to people that probably went and bought drugs. Matter of fact, there was a guy in here that totally convinced me that he needed help. And it was one of our elders that raised the flags. And for, thank goodness for that person, for that elder, because we did not give him the money. 
we found out that the guy was a con artist. But look what they did. Look what all they carried. The whole thing was a trick. Let me remind you that when the devil comes, especially when he tries to tempt you to trip you up, he's not going to come in a red suit with a ponytail and, a, and, and horns. You know, I think that's the worst thing that we could have done is it painted the devil as, as this little guy in the red horn and the big old tail. You know, carrying a pitchfork or something. Maybe he even comes smelling like smoke. He's not going to come that way. When the devil comes into your life, he's going to cause trouble for you, and he will appear as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, and no, And do not marvel, for even Satan fashions himself into an angel of light. What I'm telling you is the devil is going to come. It's going to make sense. We got to be smarter than that. We have to understand that we cannot fall into that trap. He will make plans that appear to be perfect for your life. But look what he does. He used deceptive words. We read that in, in chapter 9, verses 6 through 13. Again and again, they lied. Verses 6, 9, 11, and 12, they claim to be something they were not. Just like when people come in and saying that they are followers of Christ. What is the purpose of the church? Many times I've been told the purpose of the church is to help the poor. That is not the purpose of the church. What did Jesus say? The poor will always be with us. The purpose of the church is to deliver the message of Jesus Christ that he died for you and he rose on the third day and that you're going to go to hell if you don't believe in Jesus Christ. That is what the church is about. We're not a social club that gathers money to go help people. It's a good thing. The Muslims do that. The devil does that. What are we doing different? I know many people in this church have a good heart. And they want to help people. Joshua, he had a good heart. You know, he wanted to believe that he was not alone. Israel's coming across and taking all these lands. Joshua must have heard that all of these kings are conspiring together to fight against him. And then comes a, somebody from far away and says, we want to be your friend. And he goes, man, finally, I'm not alone. Finally, somebody can come next to me. Finally, somebody. See, he was eager not to be alone. And many churches do the same thing. We make covenants with churches that are not even believing the word of God. I've done that. I've dealt with the Presbyterian PCUSA. I've dealt with other churches. Matter of fact, this church used to belong to one organization that don't believe in the Word of God. The Disciples of Christ. I'm telling you, the Word of God says... A man laying with a man as he lays with a woman is an abomination. I don't care what your pastors, your priests, your bishops, or your apostle says. The word of God says it very clearly. I will not be deceived. It is not okay. The disciples of Christ actually said that the Bible is not the word of God. How can a church proclaim that Jesus Christ and deny his word? And John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. If you deny the word of God, you're denying God. How can you be called a Christian organization? You have been deceived, just as Joshua was with the Gibeonites. He uses slick, enticing words to get you to yield to his plans. 
In other words, I've been told, Jim, I preached a sermon not too long ago about getting that curse out of your house, about the tithe. Pastors told me if they had preached that sermon, half the congregation would have gotten up and walked out because they don't want to hear that. They've been deceived. The church cannot operate without your tithes and your offering. Let me take that back. The church can operate with your tithe, without your tithes and offering, but God wants you to be part of the blessing. That's why he's asking you to give your tithes and your offering. Making that correction, I'll make a correction I did last week. While I'm at it, you walk by sight and not by faith. Anybody catch that? I didn't say that, by the way. The devil did. Just a, No. Actually, I looked at my notes. I said it correctly. The problem was I didn't finish the statement. When I was talking about the world and people, we have a tendency of wanting to walk by sight and not by faith, that we should not be looking for the results before we have the faith. We should have the faith first and then see the results. I had not finished the statement, which it came out incorrectly, and it's a good thing because... There's a whole bunch of you that caught it, which is what you're supposed to do. Why? Because you, you don't want wrong information to be out. How many of you believe that we should walk by faith and not by sight? Come on. You guys are thinking about it, if I twisted it or not. That's all right. Here's the problem. The devil's going to give you every reason to follow him. He's going to justify everything that he does. It's going to make perfect sense. And when you have followed him out of God's will, you're going to be in trouble. And by the time you look back, you're going to wonder, what happened? Why am I living in this rot? Why am I living in this sin? What went wrong? But I wonder, have you ever thought of the lies that the devil was whispering in the ears of Abel when Abel killed Cain? I wonder what lies the devil speaking to David make him go sleep with Bathsheba. What about Judas? I wonder what lies he was telling Judas when he betrayed our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I, heard, I read a book the other day, it said Judas really wasn't a bad guy because what he wanted to do was he wanted to usher in the kingdom of God. At first, I caught on to that, and I said, man, that kind of makes sense. But then I'm thinking about, wait a minute, no. He was not a good guy. He was listening to a lie, and he betrayed his master. He betrayed the Messiah. You could twist it any way you want to. You could say, wow, you know, Lord, I don't tithe because... You can twist it any way you want to. I don't support missions because. I don't want to do this because. I've been told from right here from this church that they do not give any money because they don't like the pastor. I said, really? Since when have you given me money? But, Again, got to be careful because somebody this week did give me money. It's only five dollars with with another zero on it. Now my question is, what am I supposed to do with it? <laughs> You see, Satan uses words to tell us what we want to hear. We listen to the people that tell us what we want to hear, and there's things that happens. We want people to even lie to us to make us feel good. We like to tell, hear people tell us how smart we are or how good-looking we are. 
I love this statement. I read this one in one of Jeremiah's books. And the person came to him and says, you sure do look good. You lost a lot of weight, didn't you? And Jeremiah responded, he says, yeah, I look really good, but I actually gained five pounds. And so what he was saying was, they were just telling him what they thought he wanted to hear and not the truth. What did the Gibeonites do? They pushed all the right buttons because they knew the leader of Israel would want to hear nice things about them. The Gibeonites were smart enough to know that the leader of Israel would not kill them if they're saying nice things about Israel and nice things about their God. I had people come in. They don't come in cussing me out. They don't come in telling me how bad I am. They come in and says how great this church is, how great this is. Had a guy call the other day. Ian answered the call. He says, hey, this guy wants to talk to you because he wants prayer. Before I even went to the phone, what did I tell you? He wants money. Picked up the phone. Can you pray? I'd love to pray for you. Well, I need my light bill paid. Tell you what, let's pray that God will provide you with a job to pay for your light bill. Well, I was told you help with light bills. Well, you told the guy that answered the phone that you wanted prayer. And I would love to pray with you. Cussed me out and hung up the phone. What was he doing? He was doing what the Gibeonites were doing. I mean, how many of us would refuse prayer? Don't think the devil people know that? In, in 2 Corinthians 2.11, that no advantage may be given to us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his devices. When all the kings of Canaan heard what was happened to Ai and Jericho, they joined forces to defeat Israel. But they formed alliances to fight against Israel. They formed them, and the devil's people will always get together. Even though these kings were fighting each other, they hated each other, but they hated the other people more, therefore they wouldn't even come together. There's a saying out west, and it is, I believe, is a true statement. The U.S. Calvary would have never defeated the American indigenous Indians, the Apaches, the Sioux, all of them together, if they had come together. But how did the Calvary find other tribes? Who are their scouts? The other guys from the other tribes. But if it, what, ha, what would have happened if the American Indians, all the tribes, would have gotten together? You think Custer was a bad scene? But see, this is what was happening with Israel. Joshua was alone. He was facing all of these nations coming together against him. And he was eager to have a, fris a, fr have a friend. He was eager to have somebody that he could work with. So Satan devised a plan. See, Satan had designed a plan. He says, I got enough people here to destroy them. But let us now break Israel because the devil knows when Israel sins, they lose battles. And so they made a deal. Satan knows that he is lost. Satan lost the battle in heaven. And now the battle is here on earth. This may shock many of you people. Satan is not in hell. Satan is right here on this planet. One day he will be cast into hell. One day he will be thrown down. One day he will be destroyed. But today he is on this earth and he is trying to destroy us. When he was cast out of heaven, he was cast to earth. And we read that in Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast down, the old serpent, he that is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was cast down to the earth, and his angels were cast down with him. What happened? One third of the angels followed him. Those are what we call demons. 
and demons come to you in the night. Demons will come to you pretending to be a loved one that has passed away. The demons will come to you and try to trick you. The Bible says, test those spirits. Claim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil one day will be placed in hell forever. We read that in Revelation 20.10. And the devil, listen very carefully, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where also the beasts and the false prophets, and they shall be tormented day and night. This verse here in Revelation 20.10 says there's going to be two points here. One, at the end of the tribulation, the false prophet, those false teachers, those that are saying there's no words here, this is not the word of God, those that are saying it's okay to be homosexual, those that are saying it's okay to do these things, those are the false prophets, and they, at the end of the tribulation, will be thrown into the lake of fire, and the Antichrist, the beast, will be thrown into the lake of fire. And the Antichrist will come, and the Bible tells us he will be cunning. He will make perfect sense. He's going to tell you, you don't need to go to church. I love the, I love the, the actually made me sick when I heard pastor says, the devil thinks he closed the church. <laughs> we just relocated the church. You're a fool. The devil tricked you and you closed the church. Because if this was not intended by God, then why are we here? Why aren't we just doing church, home churches right now? If that's what God wanted at that time when COVID came out, why did they come back to the church? Because they were deceived, they were cowards. And when the Antichrist comes, the people are going to have to stand up. You're going to have to face the truth. And the devil will come and try to destroy. The enemy can be very destructive. It can destroy families. In Joshua 9, 14 through 16, the Gibeonites, when they heard that the army of Israel was heading their direction, they did everything to protect themselves. They even wanted to make alliances with the enemy as long as they did not get killed. They did a calculation they came to a conclusion. They understood that Israel was going to take the land. And they wanted to make a deal with Israel. Today, our churches are so weak that the devil don't even want to make a deal with the church anymore because we fold up when the wind blows in the wrong direction. I almost didn't want to preach today for something that's happening in my family. I didn't want to come here today. But I cannot allow the devil to break and break us apart. We better never make a deal with the devil. The Gibeonites came with a story that makes perfect sense. But everything he said was a lie. In John 8, 44, it says, When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Don't believe the lies of the, of the devil that's trying to destroy your peace and your love and your compassion. Don't get impressed by what the devil's trying to do. He's a liar and he's a cheat. If you notice when you read the scriptures that he broke bread with the Gibeonites. And in the, oh, that tradition, breaking bread with someone, it means fellowship, it means brotherhood, it means connection. This is why Jesus said, you do this and remember to me. That's why we break bread every day, every Sunday when we come in here. That's why we do the Lord's Supper. We break bread with the Lord because we are part of him. We don't need to invite the enemy into that table. The Bible says, if you take this, with, with wrong intentions, you take on condemnation. Because Jesus don't want to break bread with the devil. He wants to break bread with his children. In those days, it means friendship. 
what they considered to be right thing to do turned out to be the wrong thing. God had told them that not to make a covenant. If you turn to Deuteronomy 7, it's on page 277 of your pew Bible. Deuteronomy 7, verse 1. When the Lord God brings you into the land which you go to possess and cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Gergesites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Pretzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them unto you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them. What did, what did Joshua do wrong? He made a covenant with them. It says, you shall not make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will arouse against them, and you be destroyed suddenly. The devil knew this. What happened to Israel? Why is there so much turmoil in Israel? Because they disobeyed the commandments of God. People come into our church all the time asking for help, and we're supposed to have compassion for them. But yet, when you start talking about the Word of God, they want to run the other way. I know there's a lot of people that would love to hear what they want to hear. They got itching ears. Don't hear what I'm saying. I don't care if you don't listen to what I'm saying. Pick up the word of God and read it. See what the word of God is telling you. Seek his counsel. Don't be deceived from this pulpit. Don't be deceived from any pulpit. There's going to be a time when it's going to be hard to find truth being preached from the word from the pulpits across America. But many times people read about this in Israel. How could how could Joshua, the man of God, how could he be deceived so simple? May I remind you, there are scriptures in the Bible that tells us things to do. There's things in the Bible that tells us what we have to do, and we are disobedient to that. How can we point our fingers and say, shame on those Israelites? We might want to say, shame on us. We get ourselves in trouble as, we, as the child of God when we get too close to the enemy. We find all kinds of troubles we soon, we soon become just like them. I'm going to share some things you should hear, but you will not hear from any pulpit or most pulpits in the, church, in, in the churches today. This is, we have a society today of Christians that have gotten so friendly with the enemy that now the Christians have become just like the enemy. Have you noticed that these Christians, when they spend too much time with the enemy... They dress just like the enemy. They talk just like the enemy. But yet they profess to be saved. One guy asked me, he said, I've been watching your, your videos. You always got a suit or a nice shirt on. You know, that's old-fashioned. And I says, you know what's old-fashioned? He says, what's that? He says, listening to the devil. That should be old-fashioned. Quit listening to the devil. Be a different kind of person. Be a transformed person. Movie stars. When they go to the Oscars, they wear street clothes, right? When they're getting their rewards, they wear regular street clothes, raggedy clothes. So when the de people that serve the devil... When the devil's giving them their rewards, they dress up. But when the people of God come to get the rewards from God, from hearing his word, we don't want to be bothered. Why is that? 
Because this is not important to you. If this was important to you, you would dress up. If you were invited to the mayor's office, and says, we're going to have televisions, we're going to have all these people here, and we're going to pick out the best-dressed person here, and we're going to give a million dollars to. Would you, wear, would you wear just your regular clothes? Now, I'm going to be care- I'm going to be, I want you to be very careful what I'm saying here. Don't judge the person next to you by the way they're dressed. This is for you and you to look in the mirror. This is not for you to judge other people because they just may be wearing the best clothes they got. They may just be coming because they're trying to find their way still. And when we start becoming judgmental, we run them out. What I'm telling you, look at yourself. Look in a mirror. And ask yourself, is this how I want to show up if God came here today? Is this how I want God to see me? Well, it's just the way I am. I heard that so many times. This is the way I am. Live with it. Jesus didn't come for you to live just the way you are. Jesus came for you to change your life. He came for you to be transformed. And the devil uses every trick in the book. When you say you're saved, it means you're saved from something. That means your life should be changed. You are a new creature now in Christ. You are a different person. And it should show. I remember stories my dad telling us when he was growing up in America. I didn't grow up in America. But those of you that went to Pucallpa, how did those kids come to church? Clean and wearing the best they had. Some of it was nothing. But they took the time. You know, they didn't have a a shower. They didn't have hot water. They couldn't walk into it. I mean... A lot of these kids were taking baths in tubs with with buckets of water over their heads. But on Sunday morning, they got cleaned up. What excuse do we have? Well, the devil devil's pretty good at it. You don't need to get dressed up. You know, that's old-fashioned. You don't need to get cleaned up. That's old-fashioned. You don't need to do that. That's old-fashioned. You know, look what the world is doing. The world goes through these things. You You don't have to do these things anymore. That's old-fashioned. Are you like the world? Or are you a peculiar person transformed by the power of the blood of Jesus? What respect do you give the man that died on that rugged cross for you? Do what you want. But as Joshua said, me and my house... We will follow the Lord. We looked at the enemy. He can be deceptive. The enemy can be destructive. But here's the key. The enemy can be destroyed. In John, 1 John 2, 15 and 16, Love not the world, neither the things of the world that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of him, the Father, is not in him. For all this is in the world, The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the vein of glory of life, it is not of the Father, but of this world. The Bible says we need to be different. We need not to be deceived. Tribulation's coming. And there's tribulations that people have in this church and probably even online that people don't know. There's people hurting right now that people don't even know about. There's people coming in here seeking something. And we have a tendency of judging the flesh and not the spirit. 
I tell you this, I don't care how you come. I don't care how you are dressed as long as you got clothes on. Come and hear the word of God. Take it into your heart. Break the power of the devil. He cannot destroy you unless you allow him. We all have struggles. Some of us have more struggles than others. But my struggles are my struggles. You may look at my struggles and say, oh, those are nothing compared to mine. I'm not comparing my struggles to yours. I'm comparing my struggles to mine. Invite people. But don't be deceived. Don't make a deal with the devil. We have nothing to do with that world out there. What we do have is to conquer that world out there. We can't do it by making a deal with the world. We cannot make a deal from the pulpit with the devil to fill the, the, the sanctuary. Why are we so subject to the, to the tricks of the devil? The devil's going to make you hate your children. The devil's going to try to break up your family. The devil's going to try to break up your church. The devil's trying the best to break up this nation. I've been told, don't get political from the pulpit. But I'm going to tell you, you vote for someone that likes to kill babies, you're a fool. Why? Because you're coming in cahoot with the devil. I will tell you this, and a 13-year-old girl corrected me one day. She asked me, who are you voting for? And I said, this person I'm voting for. She goes, why are you voting for him? I went, well, that's the lesser of the two evils. And she looked at me, so you're still voting for the evil. And I looked at her and I went, man, I don't like, I don't like these kids that make you think. But she's right. Why don't we have Christians in political office? Why don't we have Christians that are running for president of the United States? We did, but nobody voted for him because he was a Baptist. I had a member in our church that says, I'll never vote for him because he's a Baptist. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Huckleberry. He was a pastor from a Baptist denomination. Poor guy. Seriously? The devil, again, that people in that church was deceived by the devil. We need not to make a deal with the devil. The devil can be defeated. You cannot make a covenant with the devil and a covenant with God and expect everything to work out right. Make your choice. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you. Lord, we've made deals in the past. We've compromised in the past. We ask, Lord, forgive us, Lord. Open our eyes, Lord. And I pray that prayer I haven't prayed in many years, Lord. Lord, let me see with the eyes of Jesus. Let me have the heart that Jesus had. And let me see what you want me to see and guide me on the path that you have for me. That I will one day hear, good and faithful servant. I pray that, Lord, for myself, for my family for this church, and for all of those that are hearing my voice. We thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.